He's picked a World Cup squad he believes can play a style that reflects what New Zealanders are all about. The Black Ferns start their title defence in Auckland in less than a month's time. Smith says they want to play a fast, attacking style against the more traditional game plans of their Northern Hemisphere rivals. We don't want to follow what other teams are doing. We want to be New Zealanders. We want to reflect our country. You know, we're brought up on number eight wire. You can fix a broken fan belt with a stocking and, you know... That's us, and I want us to be that sort of team and make the people really um, excited but also proud of, of what we're trying to do out there. Meanwhile, All Blacks coach Ian Foster is urging his side to produce consecutive victories after a season blighted by inconsistency. The Black Caps are yet to win two games in a row this year, but victory over Australia in tomorrow night's Bledisloe Cup opener in Melbourne would give them just that following last week's thumping of Argentina. Foster says there's no point in being over-paranoid about the team's inability to back up performances, but he says instilling confidence in his side has been a focus. When you have a couple of losses early in the season, it's easy to to, to go into your shell and, and you end up wanting something so much that you, you, you stifle a little bit of the way that you play. And um, So it's just a matter of encouraging people that you know, you know your role, you, you're prepared, well, just go and do it. And it's been announced that an All Blacks 15 will play Ireland A in Dublin in November. It's a week before a New Zealand side takes on the Barbarians at Tottenham Stadium. New Zealand rowing great Mahi Drysdale will take part in an exhibition race at next week's World Championships in the Czech Republic to honour one of the country's favourite athletes, Andre Sinek. Sinek, a three-time Olympic medalist and five-time world champion in the men's single skulls, retired last year. And British boxer Anthony Joshua's camp say they have accepted terms for a December fight with compatriot Tyson Fury. Koi nā nā pūrongo, hakenikina. I'm Catherine Ryan. On 9 to noon today, are the tables turning in the Ukraine war? New Zealand's first and only not-for-profit power company launches. Sylvia vasquez Lavado, Peruvian-American explorer, mountaineer and social entrepreneur. We mark the 50th anniversary of the Māori language petition with the great niece of the driving force behind it, Hana Tehimara. And how do some artists imagine and create futures in their music? Join me on 9 to noon on RNZ National. Funded through New Zealand on air. The forecast now from Met Service to midnight. Northland to Waikato and also Coromandel Bay of Plenty and Taupo. Morning rain in the far north. Otherwise, a few showers becoming confined to Bay of Plenty and Taupo this evening. Gisborne to Wairarapa. Showers spreading north and reaching Gisborne this afternoon. Snow above 700 metres in Hawke's Bay this evening. Taihape and from Waitomo to Wellington, showers clearing most places this afternoon but lingering for Taihape with snow above 900 metres. Marlborough and Canterbury, a few showers for the coast and sounds, falling as snow above 400 metres, clearing and becoming fine throughout this afternoon. Nelson, Buller, Westland and Otago are fine apart from areas of morning cloud and the odd shower in coastal Otago, clearing this afternoon. Fjordland and Southland partly cloudy with showers hanging around coastal Southland and southern Fjordland. Chatham Islands, a few showers. In the main centres, Auckland showers clear by midday, then it's fine. South westerlies die out this evening. 15 degrees. Tauranga, mainly fine chance of a shower this afternoon. Westerlies change south easterly after dark, 16. Hamilton, mainly fine, one or two morning showers. South westerlies dying out this evening, 15. Wellington has morning rain and then it's fine, but still the chance of a shower this afternoon. Strong southerlies easing then and 10 degrees. Christchurch showers falling as snow above 400 metres this morning, clearing to fine this afternoon. South westerlies fresh this morning, high of 10. And Dunedin fine apart from one or two morning showers. Fresh south westerlies easing this morning, 11 degrees. This is RNZ National. It's 10 past. And you're listening to Morning Report. I'm Guy and Espiner. Well, Aucklanders will start casting their votes for a new mayor on Friday. It's the first election since 2016 where incumbent Phil Goff isn't running. So it's anyone's game. And the three front runners, Fessel Collins, Wayne Brown, and Viv Beck, are with me now. Kia ora, good morning to you all. Now I should say before we get into it that we are broadcasting this also on uh, Freeview Channel 50 and on our Facebook page. So if you want to check in and see what uh, how these guys check the cut of their jibs, uh, you, you can you can tune in. We'll get into the big issues soon, but look, I'm a, I'm an undecided voter, so this is quite good for me too. So I might even make my call over the next half an hour. Wayne Brown, why would I vote for you? Experience, I think. Um, I've done 
really big um, organisations in trouble before, three of them in Auckland, Vector, Transpower and Auckland District Hot Health Board. And I've got a track record of finishing big projects on time and on budget, which is something they don't have here. Viv Beck? So I've got broad experience, public-private, not-for-profit sector. Uh, I've worked with um, mayors, mayoral officers, uh, ministers and ministers' officers for many years. But the key thing that I'm bringing really is what I believe is a different style of leadership, an open mind to different perspectives, because ultimately you have, you're only one vote around that table and you need to be able to get um, sensible decisions made that uh, Aucklanders will respect. If you saw Collins. Oh, kia ora, and thanks for having us this morning. Look, I'm really interested in the future of this city. I think we've got to lift our eyes, lift our aspirations, and be a city that's filled with hope. We're just emerging out of COVID. We're now uh, without masks for some people. I still wore my mask this morning, but what's really important is that as we lift out of this particular period, that people feel like we're a connected society, and I'm really keen on ensuring that our future generations tackle, have a society they can flourish in, but we've got to tackle climate issues. We've got to decongest our roads, we've got to unclog those roads and make sure that people are connected again. I think that's the kind of council we want, I want to lead. Yeah, and we'll get into <clears> some <throat> of those issues. So let's, let's start with some of these issues, and I'm going to start with housing. Um, Wayne Brown, what do you see as the big issues for housing in the city, and, and what would you do about it? Well, in the city, I mean, the city goes from Wellsford, who never thought they were part of the city, to, to Pukeko, who didn't want to be part of the city, so it's big. And uh, I was in Karaka the other night and we were surprised to find that there's dense housing right in the middle of farmland which looks completely incongruous and they've uh, and they've uh, they've done under the some of the new rules where they have no car parking and this is inside of a rural road so the some of the rules are being applied in a weird manner and then the government's interfering just when having gone through the painful process of getting a reasonable um, district plan which and I submitted to it which is a horrible thing to process anyhow and then the government stamps in and says oh you can have three three story houses everywhere um, regardless of whether the people want that whether it's characterful or whether there's even the sewage and water supplies for those areas so uh, I think um, it's a bit of a mess really at the moment. Vivek where do you stand on this issue of intensification versus character? Um, well I think there's little doubt that we need more housing and we need affordable housing I have been to meetings across the region to, to understand people's views on this issue. I think there is a recognition that there is a place for intensification and our unitary plan provided for that and it had zoning for around 900,000 homes. What I have seen myself is where some of the intensified housing is being put up, there is an issue around some of the infrastructure that needs to go with it. Um, the public transport, the parks for kids to play, uh, areas where they're concerned about schooling. And so these these latest changes that have come now are causing a lot of concern for different reasons in different places, but they do boil down to concern. One, the view that the unitary plan had provided, there are other things we could do to be making building faster, um, in my view, um, and people are concerned about the ability to build uh, three up to three properties of three floor, uh, three stories on a, with few planning rules, um, so taking away sunlight, privacy. There's character issues uh, for some, but infrastructure is the big one. A real concern around insufficient infrastructure to go with this housing. Okay, uh, if Cecil Collins, we've seen house prices falling quite rapidly in Auckland. Is affordability still an issue? And if so, what could a mayor do about it? Yeah, I think affordability is still an issue. Salvation Army tell us that we're 30,000 houses short here, and my intention is to ensure that the housing unit within council goes out to meet the um, landlords of people where housing is unoccupied. And, you know, Stats New Zealand tell us that we could have up to 40,000 unoccupied houses. So that's the first step, is let's go out, meet them, let's talk to them about how we could at least open up those to the rental uh, market because that's one area that we could start to really address the housing shortage. When it comes to affordability, I will direct Eke Panuku, which is our regeneration arm, to ensure that there's equitable zoning or inclusion 
inclusion rezoning in all of the developments that we do. And what that means is there'll always be a, a number of the units that are being provided for in a development that are open for um, affordable housing at that price mark. I think the other thing we need to think about carefully is how we intensify. I'm pro-intensification to the degree that, you know, I think all of us here live in an apartment, but we've got to ha- have people living in apartments close to good amenity. I live next door to the library and the swimming pool and a good shopping centre. And what that means is I don't need the car. So what that does is intensification means you're close to work, you're close to school, and you won't be so reliant on a car. So I think there are a number of things that a mayor can do to really chase further increasing the supply of housing, but also recognising that affordability remains an issue for the city. OK, let's talk about crime, because, you know, we wake up every morning here in Auckland, there's been a shooting, there's been a ram raid. It, it, just let's start with your appreciation of the context of this. I mean, do we accept this as p- part of life? Is it a, is it a media beat up or a very serious problem? Wayne Brown. Well, it's boomed this year. It's probably the most booming sector of our economy, sadly. Um, my experience, I'm on the board of the Ada Who Business Association, and we've spent considerable. We spend um, about a third of our income on security patrols. Uh, and it's working. Uh, Atahu, of all places, is actually quite safe for shopping and the retailers are doing quite well. We have to do more about that. There are this calls for pol- pol- more and more police, but the, the problem is the police are not on the, on the beat anymore. Uh, there's enough police. I've been speaking to policemen, but they're in the offices. So what they could you do as mayor? Street. What could you do as mayor? As mayor, we've, the mayor's got a lot of powers. Um, well, two things I'll do. First of all, I'll try and spread the experience of Otahu across the other business associations by encouraging them to. And secondly, the mayor has the ability to call together uh, in Auckland the relevant ministers. And um, the, the minister of police is going to be told, get them, get your police out of the offices onto the street. Viv B? I think this is absolutely not OK. I think we've reached a, a threshold of crime that is just people are, are scared and it's it's disturbing what we're seeing virtually every day. I think there's a number of things a, a mayor can do. Firstly, um, stand up for the city and the resources we need around policing. Um, I do agree with having policing um, visible on the street. Uh, there's, there are some related issues that have happened through COVID. For example, uh, we do need better management of emergency housing. We need mental health and addiction services uh, and we also need funding for small businesses there was a fund a few years ago where they could access um, things like fog cannons and things that would actually make them feel a bit safer so there's an advocacy piece but I have said that within 90 days of being appointed we need to bring all of the leaders, the relevant leaders together because from a government point of view it's a cross agency solution. You've talked about a nightmare. What, yes what, I have. What, what, what is that? Well actually they have it in cities like um, hey? Amps- Am- a- Amsterdam <laughs> Um, San Francisco, where they actually appoint someone. I've suggested it could be a voluntary role, but it's somebody who actually understands the night and what needs to happen to make a night safe. And it's not only for nightlife bars and entertainment, it's for kids going Mm. to concerts, it's for families being out. And it looks at things like um, uh, security, lighting, transport options for people to be safe to get to and from things, and and policy to support businesses trading at night. So, so this is all, and this is all, okay, and this is all good, but this is all mitigation, isn't it? Like, what, what's what's behind this? Yeah, I, I've been saying for some time that we've got to take preventative measures mm. first. Look, I've published research on youth gangs in South Auckland. What's really clear is that the youth gangs start targeting and recruiting young people from the age of 10. So we've got to hold that and accept that that's what's happening. What we've got to do is divert young people's attention because if we're going to go hard on crime, we go hard on poverty. We've got to make sure that these young people come from families that are supported. That's an MSD role. And more, you know, the police have said that they're getting more money to have frontline cops. I I've encouraged the police commissioner to go with community constables because they have good connections to the community. What you're going to do is establish trust with communities that have historically had poor relationships with the police. The other thing we did when I was chair of the Ōtara Papatoitoi local board was we gave some of our own discretionary funding to support local businesses because we wanted a community-wide approach. That means we had Māori wardens, Pacific wardens, Indian wardens supporting a lot of the local businesses because I acknowledge this is a real violation on those retailers who have invested so much into their businesses and we want to support them so the business arm or the business improvement district arm we call it at council can really support local retailers all right let's move to transport wayne brown what would you do about congestion in the city 
is this coming back now after the, we've ditched the masks and people are coming back into the city to 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 some degree? I've certainly noticing that the roads are busier again. What are we what are we going to do about congestion? Well, we're going to start at the top of the new board at Auckland Transport. Um, just about everything they do is wrong at the moment. So hang um, on, what you'd sack the board of Auckland Transport? Well, I would. The, um, can you do that? As yeah, a mayor? of course you can. We are. You would sack. You would sack all of them. Pretty much. I mean, there's the, they they don't run a efficient bus services. Most of them are empty, and there's nobody who's run buses on on the board. There's there's no roading engineers on the board. There's no transport user group representatives on the board. There's not an IT expert on the board. The first thing we've got to do is brain up our system and get the maximum um, use out of the roads that we've got already. We don't have any connection of our, um, our, our uh, traffic light system to um, uh, cameras. When you turn left and there's nobody crossing, you wait. Even if there's nobody crossing, because there's not a camera telling us to do that, there's, um, the buses don't have transponders that tell us that the lights that there's a bus coming. People aren't going to get on a bus because it's cheaper. They're going to get on a bus because it's faster. And so all cars well, stop know. the I same mean, I've, red I've, lights. I've been taking the bus around Auckland a bit, and partly because it's two bucks at the moment. Yeah, well, but it's, would, you, would you continue to fund that? Uh, well, no, I think that they'll get on because if you go down to Minion Road, the bus stops at the same red light as you do. In modern countries, the bus gets a transponder tells the bus that there's a lights that there's a bus coming. And after f- ten minutes, if you're sitting in your car and the bus is now five kilometres ahead of you, you might think, "Boy, it's time to change, right. change so, what I'm doing." So you're going to take your way out of it to some degree. Um, Viv yes. Beck, yeah, I think there is some change needed at Auckland Transport too. But I'll focus on congestion. Your question, I think it's a combination of things. I'm keen to see. The, northern, the success of the Northern Busway emulated um, in areas like the uh, North West, which was um, top of the list before the light rail came along. So in principle, I've got a, a package that says, let's get public transport working where it makes sense, because that does get people out of cars. The Northern Busway has got people out of cars, so we need public transport where That's it true. works to get people out of cars. I've said I want to see a focus on congestion per se, and some of the small improvements like sinking of lights, use of dynamic lanes, because an idling car has more emission than, than one that's actually free-flowing. So I want to see um, uh, some changes made on the streets that would help people move more smoothly. And you want to scrap the light rail project, though, don't you? Yes, because what I... I mean, given where we're at with the city rail link, the delays, the high cost, and the ongoing operating cost, which we don't know yet, what I'm saying is let's spend a whole lot less a lot faster to get more people connected with rapid transit that they will use because that will actually have a bigger effect on getting people out of cars. That gives us flexibility over the next decade to look at how the COVID cha- uh, changes settle, uh, what happens with technology. I mean, it may well be that there are some routes along the isthmus where a light rail will be beneficial, but there might be... Um, Technology where we've, we're all in autonomous e-vehicles dialing up an app to get us to places because of the nature of our geography. So I, I think that would get, get more people out of cars faster, cheaper, and give us time to assess what's happening with technology and the COVID changes. Fessel Collins, you, you, you voted against the regional fuel tax, didn't, didn't you? I mean, isn't, isn't that a, a, a part of funding a lot of these improvements that you might want to see? Yeah, I think we need to look at our funding mechanisms a whole lot better than, say, a regional fuel tax. And I voted against it because it's uh, a tax that has the biggest impact on poorer communities. I represent currently as the councillor for Manuko, the poorest ward in the city, and that's why I voted against that. But I think what we should be focusing on is how we're going to get people out of the out of their cars and decongest our roads, which is good for road users who need to be using their cars. Fair Free Public Transport has been supported by 73% of Aucklanders in a poll that we undertook and what that does is it removes the immediate price barrier that people are facing Hang so on, that's you're talking to about put. totally free public transport? That's right. What's that going to cost? That's going to cost us at all estimates at around around two hundred and thirty six million dollars, and there is money in, a, in the pools that we have available to us for Auckland Transport. What there do you, are what do you other guys think about that? I mean, as a consumer of public transport, and I do use it a bit, 
Um, That'd be pretty good for me until I uh, maybe until I looked at my rates bill. We can talk about that. So but, Auckland Transport reckon it's going to cost half a billion by 2030. Like I support. Now. I, I support it. I support it for over 65s, um, people on well, community service. Well, it's, it's already over 65s. And, and, and students as well, because that supports them and it gets them into public Over 65s early. can 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 day trip to yeah. Waiheke for nothing. But the can't reality they? is, I don't thanks support to, it for Thanks to Winston I, The data I've seen, if you actually, um, it's not the free that gets people out of cars. It's a service that gets them where they want to go when they want to get there. It's a bit of both, isn't it? Well, no, the data says it's only 1% to 2% will come out of a car if if the service isn't good. Well, old people get free buses now, and they're not catching them more than any other um, group. Um, And I've got my AT card here, and I'm often the only old person on the bus. Have you got your gold card in there? I've got my AT card. Oh, you've got your AT card. All right. I would also (laughs) have two voting councillors on the Auckland Transport Board. And I think that's how you change it, because you can't just sack them. You've got to get voting councillors on there so that they can direct play. And under Section 91 of the Auckland Transport Legislation, it says that they have to be aligned to council policies. So the only way you align Auckland Transport's board and council is by making sure you've got councillors on that board. So there's real ways that we can att- we can tackle the Do you the guys get the issues. bus? Is it a practical measure for you in Auckland? Uh, well, you, all if you want to know yes. what the traffic's like, I live up in K Road and I can see out my window onto the Spaghetti Junction, so I'll tell you which one's a jam. Um... I get the bu- if I get the bus down to um, the office in Queen Street when I go there, it takes it goes along K Road and it takes me 23 minutes. If I walk, it takes me 14 minutes. It's because they stick at all the red lights. All right, you're obsessed with the, this tech solution, um, which is which is fine. But well, it's uh, cheap, that's, that's probably... cheap to do. You know, that's a low cost, high right. impact change. Now we've touched on this with with transport, obviously very linked. Climate change. How much of a priority would it be for you as Mayor Wayne Brown? Well, I think the, the council made a brave decision to put aside quite a sum of, sum of money for it. And uh, so you've got to... Well, they want to um, reduce emissions 64% by 2030, right? That's the plan. Oh, uh, you, well, you can make lots of plans for what you're going to do uh, in 30 years away, when we, we may not even be alive. Well, um, hang on, that's eight years on my, my, my maths. Oh, well, sorry, but some of the 30-year things that you, you do read about. and So... Um, the continual movement of uh, to electrification is fine. I'd shift all of the containers off the wharf onto trains. Um, that's that's a great bite that doesn't uh, um, cost anybody anything and removes congestion straight away and sets a good light and would encourage the government to be doing more about freight on trains because that that's a win win. Is all anyone all interested in um, making it free to park an electric vehicle? He says as an owner of a Leaf in <laughs> in in town. Uh, it's pretty hard to even get people to um, do the right thing with uh, disabled car parking, um, and so um, policing that's not uh, would cost more than the advantages you get out of it. W- w- how much of a priority would it be for you two? Oh, I think we do have to get emissions down. I just think we have to have a, pl- a feasible plan that people um, buy into. I think going from one percent to seventeen percent active mode is not a feasible target. Hang, hang, fact, this, this, so, so, you mean the, the, the walking and scooter rides are supposed yeah. to increase I but think I'm from one to seventeen percent under that, this new that, plan, right? That, you, so, you're saying that that's not uh, uh, practical. No, even uh, the report says they're not guaranteeing it's feasible. I want to focus on electrifying the fleet, by, the bus fleet, by 2030. And providing um, the mechanism to support people moving to e-vehicles. Uh, so I'm, I'm a, I think we do need to get emissions down, but I just think we have to understand that. I mean, over the last few months, going right round the region, many people can't get public transport. What, what? I want to make public transport more available for yeah. people to help get the emissions down, and I want to focus on electrifying the fleet. We can do that and supporting the move to electrification. But I think to set targets that we don't know are feasible is is actually not going to get great support from people. Fissel? Climate action is the driving motivation in my campaign. We've got to do better. We've had young people marching up Queen Street telling us it's not enough just to declare a climate emergency. You've got to take steps to make it real. And so that's what's going to drive me. And I'm driven because that if our young people have a planet that is burning and that's warming up, we've got to do everything within our powers to uh, to change so what, what's what going on. So what would you do? So we've got to get people onto um, walking and cycling. I support the trial of a, of a cycling lane over the Harbour Bridge. I also want to make sure that we speed up plans for a second harbour crossing because that's going to help us as well. So get, r- moving right away, 40% of our emissions come from uh, cars and we've got to get the those 
trips that are lower than six kilometres, we need to be walking and cycling more. So getting people out of their um, cars is the first thing, uh, unclogging our roads. Free public transport is going to make a difference there. We've got to plant more trees. Urban ngāhere, we've, we've got areas in the city where there's only 8% canopy cover. We've got to increase the level of urban ngāhere and cool down the city. All right. Um, I'm going to finish very quickly with just a commitment on, on rates because we've run out of time. This has been fl- flown by pretty quick, hasn't it? Um, so, but but just before I leave that, no one. So no one's going to give me a free park um, for my EV in town. No, no one's interested, no. are they? I want you to be we'll able to charge you, it though. We'll give you a free bus. <laughs> <laughs> give me a free bus. <laughs> Wayne, Wayne's got his wallet. You want to bring your wallet, take your wallet open again, or no? No, no okay. Um, let, let's stick with financial matters. It just I want a commitment on rates. Um, we'll start with you, Wayne Brown, and move around um, to, to, to My finish. My commitment is to reduce costs everywhere at the council. But right at the moment, they will not own up to what the cost of the city rail link is. And they're not actually being quite open about the other big projects, the um, the, the big sewerage interceptors either. Yeah. If they won't tell you, that's bad news. <laughs> well, okay. If it goes well, over well, by well, a billion... On that, on, on, on that, to use your phrase, well, what, what's your rates commitment to me? I mean, um, are you My gonna... rates commitment is I'll do everything I can, a, a laser-like focus on numbers to what's get the What's your number, though? Have you got a cap? They won't tell us whether we're a billion or two billion dollars over at the CRL. So anyone who's going to make a promise at the moment when you don't know what the biggest project in New Zealand is going to cost, and they're not even upset about not knowing about oh, it, all right. then they're mad. OK, well, well, Vivek, are you mad? Because I think you had a 3.5% oh, yes, rates it, commitment yeah. rise. Yeah, that, that, that's your cap, right? No what, more than that. Yeah, what I'm saying is Can you that, respond to Wayne Brown's assertion that you can't do that without those numbers? Well, I think, I mean, I do believe we've got a risk around the city rail link. There's no doubt about that. But we also know that um, we're hearing everywhere out there that there are about projects that are wasteful, overpriced, and Aucklanders are really upset about rates. I mean, you know, if you talk to someone, I've, I've been talking to people who are on fixed income, having their rates vert- almost doubled. And so I think we actually have to make a commitment that rates and, and are going to be managed tightly enough. and you go and we get the cost down. And three and a half. Final word to you, Fessel Collins, have you got a, a commitment on rates? Yeah, I've made a commitment for the first year at 3.5%, which is what I voted on in the long-term plan, but also there are other, three other levers. Do we delay any projects that we've got building? Do we stretch and make sure that we get our finances or our revenues back up? Because we've known that that revenue took a big dive, $900 million lost over the COVID period, and efficiencies. That's making sure that we're doing well, we're procuring well, but also means job losses, and we've lost 500 jobs at council. So that's the wide package that all Aucklanders need to see before we can say this is the vision for the future. All right, thank you, Fessel, and thank you, Viv Beck and Wayne Brown, for joining us this morning. Uh, good luck for the rest of the campaign, and back to you in the studio, Susie in Wellington.